Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Local Lens. I'm your host, Edward McCarver. Joe Frankie is a veteran in the paranormal world. Not only is he an accomplished investigator, he is also a seasoned researcher, demonologist, consultant, and lecturer with more than 36 years of experience. Joe is also on the board of directors for the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. That's Ed and Lorraine Warren. And tonight, he's our guest here on Local Lens. Joe, welcome. Thank welcome. you very much. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Glad to be here. I think you realized this was going to be your life's work when, in doing research for this, is you uh, mentioned you were three and a half years old mm -hmm. when you had your first paranormal experience. Can you tell us what sure. you remember about that? I, I call it a divine experience for me. Uh, I was named after my grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather. Uh, he was uh, Joseph Martin Quinn. I'm Joseph Martin Frankie. He was very proud of that fact, and I was very close to him, even though I was very young when he passed. But uh, he used to um, pick me up sometimes early in the morning, take me to church with him. He's a very devout Catholic, my, my grandfather. Um, I swear, I, I know he's a saint up there, and he's got my back. <laughs> he's kept me safe all these years. Uh, I remember one night, it was a Sunday night, because my parents were out watching football. And I uh, lived in, grew up in West Haven, Connecticut. And um, my brother and I shared a room, and I was on the bottom bunk. My mother put me to bed, and, uh, you know, I fell asleep. She said I was sound asleep. All of a sudden, I come out of the bedroom into the living room. Now, I don't remember this part, but just my mother tells the story. She's passed now, unfortunately. But I had her put it down for me in writing one day, and I have it in an email format of what um, she experienced. So I came out into the living room, and I'm like, you know, uh, what, mom, mom, dad, daddy, you know, someone called me. I could, he I could hear a, a very soft male voice say, you know, Joseph, it's, it, it's time, come with me. And I could see a light. You know, I, just, I could see a bright light, and I just heard this voice. And I remember, like, it just happened. And you were three and a half? I was, I was three and a half, because I was, Born in February and my uh, in '68, and my grandfather died in November of '71. My parents just kind of shrugged it off and said he's he's sleepwalking, you know, he's having a dream. Yeah. You know, put me back to bed. A few minutes later, same thing. I come out. You know what, mommy? What? Somebody called me. Somebody called Joe. Again, she puts me back to bed. She tucks me in. The phone rings. It's my grandmother. Can't wake up your dad. Can't wake up your father. My grandfather had passed away. In his bedroom, he had a chair, and he used to sit in a chair, and he was reading the Bible. My grandfather used to read the Bible for a little while before bed, every night. Uh, you know, and uh, I can only aspire to be like him. My grandmother couldn't wake him up. It turns out what they believe happened is he fell asleep, and he had a heart attack in his sleep. Uh. And he passed away, peacefully. So that Bible... I have to this day. It was given to me by my mother many, many years ago. It was in the family, and she gave it to me. And I use that when I need on um, cases. I bring that with me. It's a very powerful Bible, you know, because a Bible is nothing but a book filled with paper unless you believe in what's written, okay? You have to have faith. People throw that word around, faith. I, I coined a phrase from the movie Miracle on 34th Street. The original one. Mm -hmm. Faith is believing in something when tell, common sense tells you not. Because it's nothing tangible. You know, faith is, your faith is a, a very powerful weapon if you believe in things. You know, someone has a crucifix around their neck. It's nothing but a piece of metal unless you believe on what that faith. thing stands for. Let's fast forward yeah. now to, to your career uh, as a paranormal uh, researcher. You mentioned that when you're first investigating a new case... You say you are always apprehensive about it. Why is that? Yeah, you know, people ask me, they'll say, one of the most common questions is, is aren't you scared? Are you, you know, aren't you scared when you do this work? And I'm like, when I first started, absolutely I was scared. Today, no, not so much. I'm apprehensive. I respect, you know, these forces that I could be dealing with. When I go into a home or a business, I don't know what I'm going to be up against. It could be nothing. Or it could be something. You, you don't know. So you have to be apprehensive. You have to be on your guard. You know, you, you never know what to expect. More often, is it nothing or yeah. something? Yeah. I, I would say 
Today, because of Hollywood and all the movies and all the TV shows, every network out there has a paranormal TV show. Everyone's looking for the new idea or the new spin on things or you know what kind of a new show can we come out with that hasn't been done already some of the shows are are well done i, I will admit and I, I i don't watch a lot of them anymore because they're they're fun as as a researcher though is is it frustrating when you when you go out and it it's is. a wild goose chase it's it's frustrating but but here's the thing people a lot of people i don't believe they're lying they're not making this stuff up. Okay. In their mind, it's true. It's very real. Okay? And, I, and this is a lot of stuff we work with. And many times, if I make it to the point where I actually go to the home or the place of business, um, which didn't happen a lot during the COVID because, you know, it was in lockdown. But yeah. it was there, to, listen, just to lend an ear, a friendly shoulder to cry on. You know, people just wanted to be listened to and say, do I have something here? Now, if I walk into a house and there's something there, I usually can feel it. We all have psychic abilities. Some people are more, more fine-tuned than others. But mine, I believe, is more because of experience. If there's something there, and especially if it's something dark and, and not too friendly, I'll feel it. Yeah, there's something here. Let's try and figure it out. How do you out. tell that to, to the homeowners? To the Very carefully. You know, I don't want to freak people out, you know, especially if there's a family involved and there's children. You know, that, that's something very near and dear to my heart. When there's kids involved and the kids are being attacked or affected, I really get upset, mm. you know. And, uh, you know, I, I'll probably be telling you about one of our famous cases in a few minutes, but where there were babies involved, you know, 18-month-olds, twins. Tell it now. <laughs> I've, got, I've got other questions. Okay. There was a case that we started being, I think, in 2008. Okay. And I worked on the case for three or four years where a family was being um, terrified by this multiple beings. Can, can you say where it was? Or? It was in Enfield, Connecticut. Enfield, okay. in, in Connecticut. Yeah. It was an old house, had a lot of history to it, 1700s period. It was, it was an old house. Duplex. It was made into a duplex. Family lived, if you're looking at the house from the street, the family lived on the left-hand side. The right-hand side, the owner desperately was constantly working on that to so he could rent it out but he couldn't keep a renter he had renters that would leave in the middle of the night and not say anything and because some, of because they were scared off by something by this activity you would hear growling we have this on on tape we play it at our at our lectures we would hear growling you would you would see um figures we had a, we have a videotape of a entity coming out of the baby's crib Oh my God! You can actually see this thing come out, and almost like it looks at the mother, and it, and it exits stage left. Out of the baby's crib. Out of the baby's crib. My theory is that it was inside the child, because you have infestation, you have oppression, and possession, different stages. What was your first reaction when when you saw that? Well, the thing is that the weird thing is that tape was missing for almost a year, and one day my buddy found it on top of his equipment bag and he's like where'd this come from and he plays it uh, it must have been i don't know midnight and he calls me up he's like you gotta see this you gotta see this so he sent it to me and i'm like are you freaking kidding me yeah yeah and, and we're looking at it and i'm like oh i'm half asleep and i'm <laughs> looking at this and i'm like oh my god i showed it to lorraine warren i remember uh, and Lorraine looks at me like a deer in headlights. She goes, my God, honey, I've never seen anything like that before. This is coming from Lane Warren, yeah. who's who worked legend. on the Amityville Horror and, and, and the Conjuring cases. Yeah. And, you know, you can see this, and we'll, we will show this at our lectures, so people can come and see this tape. We save it to the end. It's unmistakable. I mean, we've run it through negative filters, you know, where you turn black to white, white to black, and it has mass. It actually blocks out part of the crib as it's rising up out of the crib. I, to this day, I don't know what it is. I've had some psychics tell me their, what, their impression of what it is. Um, uh, one woman told me it was a, a hellhound. I said, okay. Which is, which is what? A, a, a demonic entity. Uh, you know, another word for a demonic uh, you know, entity, a hellhound, Lu uh, Lucifer's disciples or whatever. But I mean, I don't care what it is. I said, but I want it out of here, you know, because it's affecting the kids. Yeah. Now, these girls are like 16 now. Going back, they were maybe one and a half, two years old at the time. 
two, 14 years ago. Do they have any memory of it, do you? Yeah, one of the girls, from what I understand, I haven't been in touch with the family in quite a few years. The family started doing TV shows, and I didn't like that, and oh. I kind of stepped aside. But one of the girls seemed to be a beacon for the activity because she seemed to be the target of the activity, and their room was the epicenter. So the father would tell me one night he went up there because the girls were awake, and, and he heard them messing around, and they're, they're in their cribs. And he, he said the father walked in, and both both of the girls had their binkies in their mouth, and they were pointing to the corner of the room. And the father said he came in with his finger up like this, and he was going to yell at them. And out of the corner of his eye, it looks to the right, and the changing table was up on end. And as soon as he looked over, it came slamming down. So it was levitating really? on two legs. Ah. And, the, and the kids are just, you know, they, they're, little, they're just, yeah, they're just yeah. babies. And they're, they're pointing at this, and it's like getting all agitated. And th there was another time where they're sitting in the living room watching TV, and, and they had a Tiffany lamp. You know what a Tiffany lamp mm -hmm. come with the point? Yeah, yeah. The Tiffany lamp levitated, turned upside down, and stuck, and went right through the hardwood floor. Made a big hole in the hardwood floor. I mean, all kinds of stuff would happen. They would see this dog-like shadow. It was the size of a dog. They called it the black dog. And it would, they'd see it going up the stairs. It would go through the hallway and disappear into the wall. And they would hear... That night, and you'll hear it on the tape, you hear one of our investigators was up there by herself, which was a no-no. So these don't ever go wander off on your own, but she was taking pictures. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she gets lifted up. She said it was like two linebackers rushed her, picked her up off her feet. And she was a big woman. She was 200 pounds or so. Lifted her off her feet, slammed her into the wall. She came crashing down. Now, you can't see this, but you can hear it. The camera's focused this way, and she's over here. And she said a couple of expletives, and she screamed for me. She's like, Joe, get up here. Something just pushed me. Just, you know, she was terrified. Because huh. this has never happened to her before. Yeah, she, yeah. She, she never came back. She, she was like, I can't do this. It's not, this work isn't for everybody. Was the case finally resolved? From what I understand, there's still some activity there, but it's diminished quite a bit. We did a lot of work there. We spent three or four years on this case. Wow. I would get calls in the middle of the night when something would happen. And they're up in Enfield. I'm here in Wallingford. And I would drive up there in the middle of the night, you know, just to try and comfort them, yeah. you know. And usually when I went there, for whatever reason, maybe I just thought I was ugly. It wanted nothing to do with me, you know. But you could hear, and it's on the tape, you could hear this growling. And it was coming from everywhere. It wasn't coming, like, from a particular room or, or a wall or something. It was like all around us. And the father even comments, he's like, he goes, what's that growling? What's that growling? And the mother goes to reach down in the crib, and you can almost see her jerk her hands back. And that's when this thing comes out. You got to see it. You haven't seen it, have you? No. You got to no. see it to believe it. I'm not sure I want to see well, it. So. <laughs> you know, some people say, Joe, am I going to bring something home with me from your lecture because I'm here listening to you? I'm like, no. But, Which is the perfect segue to another question I want to uh, I think I know what you're going to gonna talk ask. about. <laughs> You you have said, in doing research for this, you have said that performing a seance mm -hmm. or using a Ouija board yeah. is like, to quote you, opening the front door, inviting spirits. First, do you advise people not to do these two activities? Yes, and what, what's absolutely. Been your experience? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so using a Ouija board, um, an old uh, a priest that I know, he's an exorcist, uh, he was, his name is Father Gary Thomas. I remember speaking to him years ago. He was the priest that the movie The Rite was based on. Okay. The young priest. R-I-T-E stands for The Rite of Exorcism. Uh, movie 2012, it, it came out, and uh, Anthony Hopkins was in it. Very good movie. Father Gary Thomas, he said there has to be a way in. There has to be a way that these things are invited in. One of the easiest ways is to use a Ouija board. And it's not so much the board. It's just a game. It's the context it's the intent, the constant text in which you use the board. You, if you're intending to summon spirits, doesn't mean if you use a Ouija board that you're, you're going to have a problem. But why, why roll the dice and take that chance? It's a gamble. It's a gamble. Yeah. Right. It's a gamble. And if it's one thing that Ed taught me, he's like, Joe, spirits don't come on your time. They come on their time. So you may just, you know, you might say, you know, if there's a spirit here, make yourself known to us. Nothing happens. You know, but then maybe down the road could be 
a week, a year, 10 years. When you're at a very vulnerable point in your life, you may be depressed or maybe you have an addiction, alcohol or drugs or something, that's when they're going to strike or that's when they, they're, they're going to come after you when you're, you're weak as So by point. using that Ouija board. That Ouija board or that seance, which is basically using a Ouija board just without the board. You're sitting there all holding hands around the table saying, yeah, if there's a spirit here, why do that? Why do a spirit box session? Same thing. You're doing an EVP or a spirit box session. They EVP, do it all the EVP time. Is... Electronic voice phenomena. Okay. You take a, a recorder, you put it on the table, and you start asking questions, leave a few seconds for a response, and then you go back and listen later and see if you catch something on tape. I, I don't advise doing that. If you have a Ouija board and you're listening to this program, I say you get rid of it. You know, um, some people, one woman asked me last night, what's the best way to get rid of it? I said, bury it. Consecrate the ground and bury it. Bury it somewhere and just forget about it. Yeah, sure, you can throw it away. I had a case where they threw it away and it came back. Really? They threw it in the garbage. They said, Joe, I watched the garbage guy take the bag and throw it in the truck. And they came back in the house the next day and, and it was sitting on the kitchen table. Really? I kid you not. Oh. So there has to be a way in. Whether you let this in consciously or unconsciously, you know, you. that's what I said. You're, it's like opening your front door and saying, hey, come on in. Well, and it could happen year, years later. It could. You Absolutely. use the Ouija board today and like five years from now. Yeah, there's no, there's no time or distance in the spirit world. I mean, you know, it could be 20 years later. And you may not even put that together. Like 20 years ago, yeah. I was using a Ouija board. And you, know, you got these TV shows out there with these thrill seekers, I call them. They're, they're on there for sensationalism. Like, if this is the gates of hell, why don't you rise up and get us? What are you saying? I, I said, yeah, you know, you're a showman. You, you're, you're, you're doing this for sensationalism for your TV program. But now you can get an attachment. You can be affected. And then who's going to help you? Is there a lot of that out there, you think? Uh, there's, there's, more than, there's more, yeah, there's more than you think. And, you know, is that because of Hollywood? And yeah, a lot of it's, yeah, a lot of it's Hollywood. These television shows, these producers, I've dealt with them. They're like, okay, well, this is what we want you to do. This is what we want you to say. This is what we want you to stand. I'm like, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm going to do my work the way I was trained to do it. You know, I'm getting these, these kids, you know, fresh out of college, and they're just doing their job. I get it. I want no part of it. I haven't done a TV show in years. The show Ghost Hunters was, we were contacted by Pilgrim Films back in 2002, 2003. Okay. Still have the email. They wanted to fly us out to L.A. and do a pilot series for the show Ghost Hunters. And we thought about it, and we turned it down. Just about everybody who's interested in this subject knows the show Ghost Hunters. Yeah. It's been around for 20 yep. years. You know, and um, it's it's well done. You know, it's, it's, it's entertaining. But if you look at the credits at the end of any, any of these shows, it usually says for entertainment purposes only. Really? In small lot, print? Well, yeah. yeah. Because a lot, a lot of the evidence, and I won't say which show, but I know for a fact that a lot of these shows, the evidence is fake. With or without the knowledge of the paranormal people... Yeah. The people behind the scene. Look, you got you got to put on a half hour show or an hour show, and that show has to be palatable for your viewers. And and what's your job? Your job is to get viewers so you can get ratings, so you can get what money? You can get another season. Yeah. If you don't get the ratings, you're gonna get canceled. Yeah. I've seen shows that were canceled after three episodes because they couldn't get the ratings. So you're getting the ratings because nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about something yeah. else in, in so, your business. Yeah. You have said. The most difficult part of what you do is not actually finding the spirit, but what to do after the spirit is found. T talk a bit about yeah, that. Yeah, well, spirits, spirits, depending on the situation. Now, let's talk about earthbound spirits, you know, which are could be a past loved one that may need help in crossing over. We call that spirit rescue, or they may come in visitation. Um, you know, when you, you may be down or you might be going through a troubled time in your life and, um, you know, maybe the spirit of your, your past loved one, maybe a grandparent or a parent okay. will come in to comfort you. But people don't understand fully how to handle that because they're not used to it. And we've dealt with cases uh, like that. Um, and those are those are beautiful cases. You know, we had a case in Westport some years ago where, the woman was kind of scared because she would hear noises in her house that she couldn't explain. And it was just her and her son. And at times her boyfriend would live there, you know, between okay. his house and hers. And, and they would, she would hear her piano playing. 
and it was her mother's piano. She would smell lavender perfume, which was her mother's perfume. So we went out there and we discerned that this we think this may be your mom. Because she was going through a tough time. She was divorced. She's got an eight-year-old child. And I think the child had, was autistic. She was going through a rough period. We, with our, some of our equipment, we picked up her mom's voice. And she just broke down in tears of happiness, of joy. And so said, not all spirits. No, are... no. I mean, most of the cases we work on are earthbound. Demonic cases where it requires exorcisms are extremely rare. TV, Hollywood, we want you to believe there's a demon lurking around every corner. Because that's what puts butts in the seats. Yeah. You know, um, when you have this, even the movie, the Conjuring movies, are based on actual cases. But once Hollywood gets a hold of it, they take a lot of liberties. You know, once they get their talents in it and they put their spin on it. And a lot of, I was sitting with Lorraine in her kitchen uh, after the first Conjuring movie came out in 2013. And there was a scene where Lorraine, like, fell down through the floor into the basement and I'm like Lorraine I don't remember you guys telling me about that and she's like oh, oh honey that didn't happen <laughs> she's like no that was Hollywood yeah. but you know it made it more interesting and Chris and I talk her, her grandson we talk about this all the time like if they had just told the true story it's a hell of a lot more interesting than what they're showing that lavender story you just told that guy that would be a, would be a we great we got story. validation on that case from the homeowner that she's like that's my mother's voice that was my mother's perfume. That was my mother's piano that would play. And it's not like you would play Beethoven. You'd, you'd hear, you know, they'd be upstairs in bed and you'd hear the notes. Yeah, yeah. And we were there one night and we heard it play in the other room. We heard ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, do you have a cat? And she's like, no, she didn't have any animals. I thought maybe the cat was walking yeah, on the yeah. keys. And like, that was really cool. And then we picked, up the, picked that up with our recording devices. Wow. You know, so most of them are, have happy endings. Yeah. Some cases are just what I call psychosomatic. People really believe they have an issue. They're not making it up. I don't think they're lying. But, you know, that's why I'll interview the family separately, like the police do, you know. Yeah. And I'll get the wife that'll tell me a bunch of this stuff, and the husband will be like, I don't know, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. And not all the family members are on board because they're not all having the experiences. We, uh, we only have a, uh, a few minutes Gosh. remaining, uh, about... About six minutes. I'm going to ask a Hollywood question. So, um, okay. Can you talk a bit about Annabelle? Annabelle, yes. I uh, love that doll. Uh, the Annabelle story um, is happened back in the 70s, early mid, early, early mid 70s. Uh, the doll was given to a nurse. I think she was 27 years old, but okay. you know, I think her mother gave her the doll as a birthday present. And the nurse um, had one or two other nurse roommates that, you know, split their rent. They, they worked at Hartford Hospital. And they treated the doll like a little girl. You know, this, the kid would play with a doll and, you know, have tea parties and they'd, they'd dress and it as up. normal. they put a bracelet on it yeah. and things like that. And then I, m I remember the story because I wasn't, well, I was six years old at the time. But Ed would told me the story that one day they would put the doll at the breakfast table and you know, when they're having breakfast. And one day the doll, um, the arms just levitated up onto the table. Now, as Ed, Ed tells the story, like, it didn't really scare them. It intrigued them. So they started giving recognition to this. So they brought in an, another nurse friend or someone was a medium or a psychic. And then they had a seance. Uh -huh. Tried to make contact with whatever spirit they believed was inside the doll that's when you opened the door you started giving uh, recognition to this thing and this doll it got to the point where the doll they'd come home after a double shift unlock the door and the doll would be standing in the middle of the room now this doll is a raggedy Ann doll okay made by knickerbocker from the late 60s early 70s yeah. i have a replica of it um, that I bring just to show people it's a nice, you know, conversation piece. The doll can't stand. Anybody knows a raggedy end doll? Yeah. They can't, they can't yeah. stand. This doll was witnessed, and Ed said that it happened at their home when they took the doll home because they wanted to get rid of it. And they're like, we'll take it, you know. And the doll would leave notes. They'd find notes like, miss me. They'd find notes in the apartment. So one day, one of the boyfriends, one of the girl's boyfriends was sleeping. I fell asleep on the couch. He took a nap. And he woke up with a start, and he said, I just had a dream that this doll was attacking me. 
So he got up, grabbed the doll, threw it across the room. He's like, you don't have any power, you're just a rag doll. Almost instantly, scratches. Seven scratches this time. Oh. Three across the chest and three across the stomach. Enough that it drew blood and it bled through his t-shirt. Oh, good okay? Lord. Threw the doll and it attacked him immediately. There was a priest that, after the, the warrants had taken the doll... The priest said to Ed one day when he was over visiting, he's like, yeah, show me this doll that you keep, I keep hearing about. Now, at that time, they kept the doll in a rocking chair. It wasn't in a case. In case. And the priest did the same thing. He grabbed the doll, and he's like, threw the doll, and he's like, you're just a rag doll, and God is more powerful than the devil. And Ed Warren said to him, he says, yes, Father, God is more powerful than the devil, but, but no priest is, no hundred priests. Yeah. No man is. Ed would tell me that. He said, just be careful. He says, yeah, God is, is more powerful than evil because he made that. He said, but, but no man is. And on the way home, that priest was involved in a very bad car accident. He broke his leg. He, he was okay, but he broke his leg. Destroyed his new car. And he said to Ed, he said, the last thing I remember seeing is the image of that doll. Really? In front of me, yeah. Where, where's the doll now? Is it, is, is... The doll's still at their home. There's a museum in their home. Um, the home is now owned by the daughter and, um, and, and Tony, their son-in-law. They own the house and, and all the artifacts and things. Okay. And, you know, so it's still there. Um, from what I understand, the family does want to sell the house, but where are you going to put all the artifacts in the museum? Some of those artifacts have pretty evil history to them. And uh, you don't want to be playing around with that stuff. Where, where would something like an Annabelle or other artifacts, where would, where would they go? I, I remember mentioning to Tony, you know, half kiddingly, I said, well, it's not like he could rent space out in a strip mall. You know, you got to find the right location. But until they find that right location, they're not going to be able to sell the home. That's going to be really tough. I mean, she's, Lane's passed now three, three and a half years, and the house is still there. Um, I think she still has a couple of cats that are, so they have someone that comes and takes care of the cats. Okay. Or they come and take care of the cats. There's got to be security all over the place. Yeah, they have they have they have security and stuff, and the police, you know, patrol the area. Oh, okay. But yeah, there are a lot of crazy people out there that you know have gone peeking through windows and things like that. Yeah. You know, Chris, my my friend, their grandson used to live. And there's an apartment upstairs in the second floor of the house. He used to live up there, and I would visit him uh, frequently. He had some health issues, so I was helping him out, and I'd go down and visit Lorraine and. Um, thank God, uh, Judy, their daughter. I was on a very my name was on a very short list of people she would allow to see her mom in her in her failing years. She was just a wonderful lady. Uh -huh. You know, they were both wonderful people. But uh, yeah, I got some stories I can tell you. The half hour ain't gonna cut it. I, I was, and we are just about at the end of the yeah, half yeah. hour. So, so Joe, Frankie, I just want to say. I want to say thank you. and Thank you very much. I it's want been you, a pleasure. I want you in my corner. It's if, been, it's uh, a, well, if you have a problem, you should call me. All right. This has been fun. Thank you so fun. much. I appreciate I it. A ball. All right. This has been Edward McCarver here at Local Lens. We'll see you soon.